Welcome to the Hillsdale Online Courses Podcast. I'm Kyle. And I'm Juan, and we're here back in our second episode of our podcast on the Second World Wars. Last week, you heard Dr. Arn talk about totalitarianism, which was a new form of government rising in Europe. Basically, the reason why the Allies got together to respond to that rising threat. And uh, this week, now we're turning to Dr. Hansen and his first lecture, which is titled Air. So I think it's really fitting that we begin with air power, especially considering that there's been such a massive transformation in air power in the first half of the 20th century. Dr. Hansen opens the lecture by talking about the end of World War I, right, in which you have pilots in biplanes shooting revolvers at each other. We know that uh, a short 30 years later, right, the Second World War ends with America dropping a nuclear bomb from a plane. That is a massive transformation. And, and what that does is it leads to a lot of trial and error by the military strategists as they begin this fight, as they start Second World War. And some of the faulty thinking that Dr. Hansen points to is that many people begin to believe that perhaps air power is the only thing that matters, right? That if you can gain superiority in the air, that will overcome the need to be strong in kind of the conventional forces of an army and a navy. Yeah, and, you know, he says that some people consider this transformation in air power the determining factor in the war. Of course, the rest of the course actually might call that a little bit into question, but it is certainly an important point. One of the things Dr. Hansen does is show how the Allies focused on long-range bombings, so planes that could go very long distances and... While the Axis powers couldn't match the Allies on that, so they started they started developing V1 rockets and uh, V2 ballistic missiles, and that proved to be one of the deciding factors in the war. Thank you for tuning in to our podcast on the Second World Wars. If you're interested in learning more from Hillsdale College, you can go to hillsdale.edu/course and sign up for one of our more than 40 free online courses today. And now, Dr. Hansen. I'm Victor Davis Hansen. I'm a senior fellow in classics and military history at Stanford University's Hoover Institution. And I'm a teaching fellow, a visiting professor at Hillsdale College. It's my 15th year that I've had the pleasure of teaching at Hillsdale. And I'm also the author of the recent Second World Wars. And today I'd like to talk about the role of air power in the course of World War II. World War II, of course, is the word we use in America, and it's equivalent to the European or the British notion of a second world war. There's a couple of things to remember about air power before we begin in earnest. One is that there was an enormous transformation between its inaugural appearance in 1914 in World War I when pilots and biplanes shot revolvers at each other. In less than 30 years, about 25 years, 24 years, at the outbreak in September 1st of 1939 in World War II, we had monoplanes and the speeds had increased from 100 miles an hour to nearly 300, and people were firing about seven to 800 shots per minute on machine guns, sometimes right through the propeller, sometimes on the wings, and they were carrying bomb loads in the case of fighter bombers of 500 to 1,000 pounds and bombers even far greater. So there was a miraculous transformation in the role of air power. And that created theorists or prophets, air prophets, or architects of air power, so to speak, in the European countries and in the United States as well. Billy Mitchell, Duet, Weaver in Germany. And they were so enthralled by this new weapon that they made a, a series of astounding predictions, and so much that Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin in the late 1930s said, in despair, the bomber will always get through. And it was almost as if assets at sea, navies, and assets on the ground, infantry, were going to be secondary or even irrelevant. The war would take place up in the air. The problem with that is nobody lives up in the air. Nobody eats in the air. Nobody uh, really can fly. We don't have wings. So what you're doing is transferring label, labor and capital from the ground up into the air, and there has to be a purpose for that. And the purpose had to be either air superiority or air supremacy. And by that I mean your air forces had to beat the other person's air forces for the prime reason that they could then direct their assets to where things really mattered on the ground, taking cities or territory. 
or killing people or capturing them on the ground. If you couldn't do that and you only achieved air parity, then both sides were sort of wasting their time in an irrelevant theater. So the purpose was to build more planes and better planes and train better pilots to destroy the enemy's air assets, or at least weaken them so you had air superiority. And then the holy grail was air supremacy. That meant that you could put your assets up in the air, they could fly over the enemy's territory, destroy his cities or his armies on the ground, and they would be invulnerable because you had destroyed the enemy's ability to fight back in the air. And that was pretty much the theory of air power in World War II. There's a couple of other very important concepts to remember about World War II in general that apply in particular to air power. The war was known as a series of wars from September 1939 to the invasion of the Soviet Union in June of 1941. And by that I mean they still referred, they being the general public, to the World War I as the Great War. It was only after the invasion of the Soviet Union and six months later, the subsequent declaration of war on the United States by Germany and Italy, as well as four days earlier, the surprise attack at Pearl Harbor, that it, it was conceived as a global war that had replaced World War I and now it became World War II. It's a very important concept, you see, because there was a method to the access victories before 1941. Germany invades Poland, Denmark, Norway, Luxembourg, Holland, Belgium, Belgium, France, and Yugoslavia. And in those nine victories, there were commonalities. They were all surprise attacks. They were all conducted against neighbors. And they were all waged by Germany and to a lesser extent later Italy against neighbors who were not fully prepared. In other words, they had felt that the war to end all wars that ended in 1918 would ensure perpetual peace. In the case of the British they were, and the French, they thought appeasement or the idea of giving in to Hitler or Mussolini would temper their territorial ambitions. In the case of the United States, they felt to be isolationist was much wiser not to get entangled in Europe's problems. In the case of the Soviet Union, it was active collusion under the non-aggression pact of August 1939 that meant that they would supply materiel to the Axis powers, Germany especially, and then in exchange they wouldn't have a war with the Soviet Union, but they would direct their attention to destroying capitalist democracies in Europe. But the final result of all this was people made wrong impressions. They said, my gosh, Germany just wins. Blitzkrieg, this combined use of tanks and rapid motorized transport and Junkers 87 uh, dive bombing attacks and Doiner's 17 level bombing, this is amazing. You can't stop this juggernaut. But nobody ever stopped and took a deep breath and said, has Germany's air power, along with its ground forces, has it ever really encountered an enemy that it didn't surprise attack, that was ready for it? Is it able to go vast distances, not just across the border into Poland or into France, but 1,500 miles to the Volga River? Can it reach the United States? Can it reach even Britain that's an island? And the answers were increasingly apparent that for all of the air, uh, formid formidable air assets of Germany, it could not do that. The second general theme of air power in World War II was the Allies, and by the Allies, I'm mostly talking about the alliance that emerged after 1941, and that was the Soviet Union, Great Britain, and the United States. That group of Allies emphasized practicality and numbers. In other, in other words, if they build a tank or an airplane, the overriding rationale was, is it durable? Is it easily maintained? Is it easily operated? Is it cheap to produce? In opposition to that, Germany and Japan had a very different concept. We have to build the biggest ship, or we can we'll conceive of the biggest bomber, or we have to have the closest calibrations on our cylinder head and piston, or we have to have the finest craftsmanship. And the net result was that in theory, a German fighter or Japanese fighter might have superior 
uh, maneuverability or rate of ascent in 1939, 40, 40 and 41, but it did not have the numbers or the pilot training or the support network to ensure there would be more planes in the air than the enemy. And so what happened is Germany declared war in 39 with a wonderful air arm, the Luftwaffe, and it had been seriously training and in production and organized from about 1937, even though it had been outlawed by the Versailles Treaty. But its enemies in Europe had not been doing much at all. So it found it very easy to achieve not just air superiority, but air supremacy. By 1939, it went into Poland. It was bombing Warsaw within four or five days without serious opposition in the air. When it went into Denmark, it, it overran the country in four days. Norway was a little bit more difficult because for the first time it encountered elements of the Royal Air Force of Great Britain, but nevertheless, it was much closer and it had more assets and it defeated the British in Norway. In the case of France, case of Yugoslavia, the Low Countries, Greece, again, it was fighting a neighbor that was proximate and was surprised and had not fully armed to the extent that Germany had by 1939 and 1940. And this created an aura of invincibility. No one asked uh, in Great Britain or the Soviet Union or the United States simple questions, for example, is the Mr. Schmidt BF-109, the superb German fighter that had done so well in Poland, the Low Countries, and the European conflicts around Germany, was it actually superior to any other fighter that Great Britain could put in the air, specifically the Spitfire fighter, Supermarine Spitfire? Was it better than anything the United States had? For example, in terms of fighters, was it better than the P-40? Perhaps, was it better than the Wildcat fighter? Perhaps, but was it better than things that were going to emerge very quickly, like the P-38 Lockheed and soon the P-47 and people were even dreaming of a P-51? And the answer was not clear. And more importantly, people did not ask a second question. When you fight an existential war, the question must be, do you have the ability to destroy the enemy's means of production? Now, obviously, when Germany went into Poland and they went into France or they went into Yugoslavia and Greece, they had a, a, enough air superiority that they could destroy these regional air forces and then bomb uh, strategic targets and then enforce terms on the defeated. But that was a very different question than saying to the Russians, we have air superiority to such a degree that we can go all the way to Moscow or Stalingrad or Leningrad and destroy your cities. That's a very different proposition. You have to have forward base fields, you have to have a superb train mechanics that will go with your airplanes far away from Germany's borders, and you also must have reliable fuel supplies. Can you attack the United States? Can you send a bomber 3,000 miles and hit New York? Can you even bomb London systematically to such a degree that you'll destroy its uh, means of production? And the answer of that was pretty clear by 1940, 39 and 40, the answer was no. And why was the answer of no? If you look at the strategic decisions that were made in air power, the most alarming for Germany was they never built a bomber with four engines. Now, of course, they had superb two-engine bombers, the Junkers and the Derners and the Heinkel models, were all very good airplanes. But a median bomber with two engines cannot carry more than four or 5,000 pounds of explosive. A four-engine bomber, you can double that load and you can double the range. Why didn't Germany do that? Part of the reason was it was so successful that it envisioned war as one of conquering neighbors in the general vicinity of Europe. And then, of course, other powers would be so impressed or awed they'd say, we can't defeat Germany, let's come to terms with it. So the United States or Great Britain, the Soviet Union would make a deal rather than face the onslaught of the Luftwaffe. There was another couple of reasons. The Germans got in their mind early in the 1930s that dive bombing, taking bombers and diving down on the ground rather than going higher in the air ensured great greater accuracy. That was a flawed concept, as you can see, because the idea of taking a four-engine or two-engine bomber down to the ground and putting it within range of flak batteries was sort of crazy. 
And then the third flawed concept was Germany felt that you could put two engines behind each other and on one drive shaft, so you would only have two what they called nacelles, two engines that were exposed, and that would have less drag, but they would be so powerful, they would sort of have the speed and the efficiency of a four-engine bomber. All of those concepts turned out to be flawed, and Germany went in the war in 1939 without a bomber that could really deliver a sustainable load to Great Britain, at least enough firepower to destroy its means of production. It could not reach the United States, and it could not reach the Soviet Union. And the same was true of Italy, and the same was true of Japan. Italy, in the case of directing its efforts in the Balkans, Japan fighting since 1931 on and off in Manchuria, and then later China, and then later in Southeast Asia. Again, the same formula applies. Easy victories due to surprise attack, superior preparation in the 1930s, and proximity. None of those factors applied to fighting in a whole array of new, new challenges after 1941, and that was the great distances of the Soviet Union, crossing the ocean to hit the United States, and defeating superior British air power and naval power to conquer the island of Great Britain. And so somewhere around 1941 to 1942, the Axis powers recalibrated, and they said, my gosh, we're now in a war with the United States since December 11th, 1941. We are a war with the Soviet Union since June 21st of 1941, and we never conquered Great Britain. And we have not been able to bomb the enemy into submission, or even in some cases, even reach the enemy. So then what happened? Well, what happened would be then that there were two races, so to speak, concurrent races. In Japan and Italy and Germany, they recalibrated their strategic and industrial policy. Can we make a fighter that is so much better than anything that the Allies have? Can we have a new weapon? Can we have a new bomber that can somehow rectify our tragic mistake of taking on economic, industrial, and military powers beyond our comprehension in 1941? There was an active discussion both in Germany and in Japan that something had gone wrong. These border wars that had been so successful in China, Southeast Asia, Europe, had now blossomed into something they hadn't quite conceived of. And the answer, as we're going to see, is going to be no. They did not build a four-engine bomber. They did not build fighters that were capable of ensuring air supremacy and they did not train pilots or maintenance crews that could ensure air supremacy. Meanwhile, in the United States and Great Britain and the Soviet Union, there were quantum leaps in technology and industrial production. And remember one other thing, is that the United States was 3,000 miles distant from Europe. Great Britain was always an island. So even though through isolationism and appeasement, the democracies were not really ready for World War II. There were people within them that understood, would there ever be another war, you would have to have a means of hitting a European city that was hostile with bombs uh, from your own home bases, whether it was the United States or whether it would be in Britain. And that created a need for a four-engine bomber. So as early as 1936 and 37, the United States had developed this wonderful B-17 bomber. And Britain had experimented with the Hanley Page or the Stirling Short bombers. Again, four-engine bombers uh, were built as early as 1937 to 39 in the democracies, and the Axis had no counterpart to that. And that gave them a head start because from the B-17, you would get the B-24, and then later the B-29, and from the Sterling Short or the Hanley Page, you would go to the Manchester, then the Lancaster. So by 1944 and 45, when we talk about strategic bombing, we're essentially talking about an allied phenomenon. The Axis powers did not have the equipment, the technology, the training, or the expertise, and they simply ceased even trying to do it. As far as fighters go, the same concept uh, holds true that the United States and Britain as being island and distant powers and to some extent the Soviet Union started to put a premium on distance and 
concepts like drop usable, uh, reusable, or drop tanks so that a fighter could have its regular gasoline tank, but also could have one that would drop when it got uh, a sufficient distance and, and entered combat. So the ranges for Allied aircraft started to exceed 150, 200, 300, 400, 500 miles that were allow them to escort bombers all the way into Europe. And so when we look at the individual fighters on the two sides of the conflict, by 1941, everything is starting to flip to reverse. The wonderful Mr. Schmidt 109 and the new Falkwith 190 are now being matched in the United States by a P-47, P-38, and especially a P-51 fighter that was superior in every category. In Britain, the Supermarine Spitfighter will go through iterations from Model 1 to 9, and very quickly it will match the 109 and the 190 and even become far more versatile. 90% of the aviation fuel in World War II was produced or refined either under British or American auspices. So you had more fuel. If you have more fuel, you have more time to train crews. There will be a 10 to 1 advantage in personnel in the Army Air Forces in Britain, the United States, and the Soviet Union. In other words, they will have more fuel and they'll have more money and more time to train crews, not with 10 or 20 hours, but 50, 100, 300 hours of training before they enter combat. This will all come to fruition about 1943 and 1944, in which the Allies will essentially destroy the Luftwaffe and destroy the Japanese Naval and Army Air Forces. It's no secret that Americans are more divided than ever. And it's not just over what policies will improve our great country. No, it's over whether America is great at all, whether America deserves our love. That's why Imprimus is so important. Imprimus looks at the issues of the day from a constitutional perspective, reminding citizens always of our great heritage of liberty. For more than 50 years, Imprimus has featured speeches from the smartest conservative thinkers and writers at Hillsdale events. These days, Hillsdale publishes people like Molly Hemingway, Andy Puzder, Harmeet Dillon, and Chris Rufo. Over 6.4 million American households and businesses receive Imprimus absolutely free. And I urge you to sign up for it today at no charge. To get your free lifetime subscription, go to hillsdale.edu slash lifetime right now. Or text the word Imprimus to 71844 and we'll send you a link to sign up for your free lifetime subscription. That's I-M-P-R-I-M-I-S to 7 At the same time this is happening, the Americans are starting to believe that they can send these unique four-engine bombers, and Britain, Britain can, and go into the continent of Europe and there, thereby avoid a land war. Why would they want to avoid a land war? Because they're haunted, in the case of Britain, by the... Verdun battle or the Somme battles of World War I. Horrible casualties, one million British dead, a million and a half French dead, and they don't want to repeat that. And the architects of air power have said, you know what, a four-engine bomber can go to Germany or occupied France or Eastern Europe and do what a land army could do without the commiserate casualties. Japan, to a certain extent, had the same idea that it had not built a four-engine bomber it only had fighters, and the United States then would only reach Japan through air power. It would have to have bases close enough, but it would bomb Japan into submission. And so from 43 to 45, there was a real question that the Allies alone had four engine bombers and strategic air forces, and they were going to try to hit Cologne, Berlin, Bremen, occupied German cities, as well as. Yokohama or Tokyo? And could they do it in such a way that in terms of cost-benefit analysis, they would inflict more damage more quickly than they would suffer losses themselves? By 1943, it looked for a while that the Axis had the advantages. And by that I mean 
There were not enough quality fighters to escort a B-17 or a B-24 into the Romanian oil fields or the ball bearing factories at Schweinfurt or to bomb Japan from India and China. There were great distances. Uh, the engines were not able to take huge loads of bombs that high up to avoid flak batteries. And there were not enough fighters that had to range to accompany the Allied fi uh, bombing fleets. And so if we looked at Allied bombing in 1943, we would say, my gosh, we're losing 8 and 10 percent per mission. We haven't stopped the German industrial ju juggernaut. We can't reach Tokyo from China or India. And the architects of air power were wrong. We're bombing a lot of things, but either the bombs are not hitting targets or we're losing so many planes in the process, 9, 10, 11 men per lost plane, that this is not a sustainable proposition. So one of two things ha had to happen. Either the Allies had to come up with new tactics or new machines, or they were going to lose the air war, and then it was going to look like something like World War I, where if they were able to invade, there would be trench warfare, and it would be a terrible slog analogous to the Verdun, the Somme. And so what happened was that sometime in 1943, the aggregate experience of early bombing of Germany and occupied Europe started to pay dividends. And by that I mean they started to recalibrate the B-17 with more armament, better radar, better crew training. The new B-24 had a little bit more range, a little bit more bomb capacity. They started to improve their land-based radar that could predict patterns in fighter defense. And most importantly, they developed a P-47 and a P-51 fighter with drop tanks that were able to start escorting American and British bombers all the way to Germany. And finally, they invaded France in June of 1944, and suddenly, instead of going over a hostile British Channel and a hostile France, and then into Germany and occupied Europe, they found that they could put fighter bases in occupied France that was now under their control. And so they would have a pretty safe and uh, secure route of passage, at least until the German border. And when you add all of these refinements, uh, strange things started to happen by about 1944. In other words, British and American bombers started to go from 8 7% losses per mission down to 1 or 2 General Jimmy Doolittle, the architect of the 8th Air Force's fighter wing, began to refine new tactics and say, if you're a P-47 or a P-51 or a Spitfire fighter pilot, you're now free to go after fighters without clinging or being in the general vicinity or protecting the B-17 or the Lancaster bomber. And so almost as if they were wolf packs, American and British fighters roamed all over the ground. They attacked airfields. They waited for German fighters to land or take off, and they began to literally destroy 20% per month of the Luftwaffe. This started to pay off by August of 1944, where a B-17 mission or a Lancaster mission was now pretty free to drop bombs in all of the industrial centers of Europe. It's a great question today that we ponder, was it worth it? 40,000 Americans were killed, 40,000 or so British airmen were killed, and yet up until 1944, there were very meager results in terms of harming fighter production, ball bearing production, food production, electricity production. And yet, after mid-1944, we started to see enormous results in destroying transportation, aircraft production, and tank and vehicle production. So we have this continual debate today as air power did work or it didn't work. The people say it didn't work, it was 80,000 people weren't worth it, we lost over 5,000 bomber planes, we spent 40% of our military budget, and yet German uh, industrial production kept going. The defenders of air power said, well, we had to we had to make the necessary investments. We lost men and materiel learning how to fly in the proper formation, how to have the proper fighter, the proper fighter tactics, the proper radar. But once we learned that, we destroyed Germany's industrial production. And it's not quite accurate to say 
it continued to increase in terms of vehicle or aircraft production because Germany really wasn't mobilized until Albert Speer, the czar of German industry, took control of the economy in late 1943. Once he did that, we were destroying the increase in production. And Speer's planned economy was not sustainable. So even though it increased, it did not increase at the rate that it would otherwise have had we not been bombing around the clock. Now, by the end of 1944, air power in World War II was definitely a British and American, and to a lesser extent, Soviet monopoly. So something had to change if the war was going to be salvaged on the part of the Axis powers. And what we'll see in the end of 1944 and the first months of 1945 is a desperate Axis attempt to somehow rechange the relative strengths. Now they can't do it by, in terms of production. About 50 miles from where I'm speaking right now at Willow Run, the United States is building a B-24 Liberator bomber at the rate of one per hour. And we're going to build over 20,000 uh, four-engine bombers, late model four-engine bombers here in the United States. Of the 800,000 or so airframes, which would be fighters, bombers, and trainers, about 600,000 were built in the United States. And about another 100,000 were built in the British uh, Empire. So about nine, 85 to 90, depending on how we defined a warplane, are going to be built on the Allied side. How then is Germany, and to a lesser extent Italy and Japan, going to redress that imbalance and stop the bombing, in the case of Germany and Italy, of their homeland, and the case of Japan, of stopping an, a future bombing attack in 1944? And the answer they came up with was characteristic of Axis thinking. It was going to be superior technology. It wasn't going to be more manpower, more training, more practical weapons, greater industrial production. Remember, at this time, the United States factories in Detroit or Oakland or the Midwest or the South are completely immune from attack. There has not been a serious attack in Great Britain in three years. The Soviet Union has moved most of its industrial capacity on the other side of the Ural Mountains. So you have an asymmetrical situation in which the Allies are building more and better weapons with impunity and the Axis power, or in the case of Italy and Germany in late 1943, in the case of Italy before 1943, are constantly under assault. So what did they come up with? Well, Hitler came up with what you'd expect, a bold, almost brilliant, we could say, but completely unrealistic and impractical solution. And it was characterized by what we would call cruise missiles, a V-1 rocket system, and then later a V-2 ballistic missile would be the forerunner of an intercontinental ballistic missile, the V-2 program, and then the 262 Mr. Schmidt jet. And the idea was, well, we don't have as much industry and we don't have as many people as the allies, but one Axis pilot in a jet with rockets can destroy an entire B-17 formation, or a V-1 or a V-2 rocket can hit London and create, create such terror or hit a big factory without the loss of a pilot that they will seek terms. The problem with all of these solutions were that they did not have a plan in the way of the Allies to ask themselves, how much does it cost to deliver a pound of explosive to Britain by a V-1 rocket or a V-2 rocket or a four-engine bomber? And the answer, if they had asked that question, the answer they would have come up with was, it's pretty cheap to send 2,000 pounds of explosive at 180 miles an hour on a V-1 rocket or 250, depending on the payload. But it's not very economical to send it a ballistic missile with 2,000 or 3,000 power. In fact, it costs 20 times more to put a bomb on a V-2 rocket than it did on a V-1 cruise missile. And yet, they built at least 10,000, 6,000 of which were delivered 
at London, and they almost did no damage. They killed about 4,000. Tragically, they killed about 4,000 British civilians. The V-2 rockets did, but they did no industrial damage. The V-1 killed even more British citizens, but again, they were a weapon of terror. They could not be directed accurately at a British factory. They enraged the British public. They diverted British bomber strength to find V-1 and V-2 fields in occupied Belgium and France and, and later in Holland, but they did not do damage as envisioned to the British Empire, and they could not reach the United States, and they could not reach the Soviet Union. And yet the money, the research and development cost that went into these terror weapons of the V-1 cruise missile and the V-2 rocket were comparable to the American Manhattan Project that produced the bombs that were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. In the case of the 262 Mr. Smith jet, it achieved fantastic speeds of 475, nearly 500 miles an hour, which was about 50 to 75 miles an hour faster than any prop-driven plane, whether it was the Mosquito a fighter bomber on the British side or the P-51 American that had a superb British a Merlin Rolls Royce engine in it. So in theory, they were invulnerable. You could take a 262, take off, and nobody could catch it. It could dive into a B-17. But the problem, the uh, formation and wreck havoc, but the problem was, again, they didn't produce very many. We were producing 10, 12, 15,000 P-51s, P-47s, P-38s, Corsairs, Hellcats in the Pacific, whereas the Germans were only producing about 1,200 jets. They were very hard to fly. They required a special fuel mixtures, and they were very vulnerable at takeoff. And so the jet program really, after some initial novel successes, almost was without really major results. In Japan, it was quite different because the Japanese until late 1944 had not been bombed. Remember, the Japanese strategy had been concentric rings were going to have the greater A Asia co-prosperity sphere around Japan. So we have islands like Okinawa or Iwo Jima in the first ring, and then we go out to Wake Island, we go into Tarawa, New Guinea, Java, we get to the Philippines, Singapore, Southeast Asia, and China. And what that meant was it was very hard for an American aircraft to find anywhere whether it was on a carrier, a fighter bomber, or whether it was a strategic B-17 or B-24, or later B-29, anywhere where they could hit Japan. So the American idea was Japan is not going to be defeated until we can destroy its industry, or we can invade the homeland and cut out the heart of this monster. But how can we do it when we can't get close enough? So a third generation bomber was envisioned, and this project was at uh, the B-29 project was also a billion dollar plus research and development project as expensive as the Manhattan Project. And the idea was we're going to build a four engine bomber that can go up 30,000 feet and it can fly 1,600 miles one way. And we will base them in India or we will base them in China. We will stop worrying about uh, fighter escort or flak because they cannot hit us at 30,000 feet. And unfortunately for the Americans, it was a disaster in November, December of 1944 and January and February in 1945, simply because by the time you load a B-29 with 10 or 15,000 pounds of explosives and take it up to 30,000 feet and fly it 1,600 miles uh, over the jet stream of Japan, and you have to import oil by air and gas and lubricants to service a B-29 all the way to India or China, it's, it's too expensive and the results don't justify the cost. So the Americans were in a dilemma. As late as 19, for February of 1945, Japan was untouched. And yet people were talking about, we've got to invade the Japanese homeland. So the solution they came up with is, let's use the B-29 from an island that we will take within 1,600 miles. So. In late 1944, we invaded the Mariana Islands, Guam, Tinian, and Saipan. We made 7,000-foot coral runways. And by February, we were launching two to 300 B-29s, uh, and they would fly 1,600 miles 
one way. So you can imagine the toll on the crews, even though it was a fantastic plane, it had a pressurized cabin, but it still was very hard to go up to 30,000 feet and drop bombs that would blow off course, and we were not getting any results. We were losing a number of crews to pilot air, missing the target, getting lost on the way at night all the way to Japan, and the new plane itself, the engines heated up, and there were 25,000 different parts in the cockpit alone. So it was, uh, it was a new experimental plane that had not been sufficiently tested or tried. And then something happened. In late February, a new commander, Ger General Curtis LeMay, took over the B-29 program. He said, essentially, the cost of a B-29 is like a destroyer. It's not working. The public is bewildered. The military is angry. We're going to do something different. We're going to fly to Japan and take advantage of the jet stream rather than let the jet stream take advantage of us. We're gonna take this beautiful bomber, this highly technologically sophisticated bomber, and drop it down to 7,000 feet. People were aghast. Uh, they said, you know, a Raiden or, or, or Zero fighter can't hit us at 30,000 feet. LeMay answered back, I'm not gonna wear out the engines trying to get up that high with that much explosive. In fact, we're not even gonna use explosive. Rather than have a bomb blow off course at a 400 mile an hour jet stream. We're gonna come in on the jet stream, very low, and we're gonna use a new substance called napalm, which was a magnesium aluminum liquefied uh, gasoline weapon. And we're gonna drop these bombs on mostly a wooden infrastructure of the Japanese urban cores, and we're gonna let the wind do the work. And people said, well, why did we build a B-29? It was supposed to be a sophisticated high-level bomber. And LeMay said, don't worry, we're gonna come in so fast, and we're gonna come in at night, they're not even gonna know what's gonna hit them. And on March 9th and 10th of 1945, LeMay sent over 300 B-29s at a level of about five to 7,000 feet. They went into Tokyo, and it was the most lethal day in the history of military conflict since recorded history. About 100 to 150,000 Japanese civilians, soldiers, industrial workers were killed in a raging inferno that destroyed about 14 square miles of the Japanese urban core. And from the Mariana Islands, they, were not, they did not pose the difficulty that India or China did. They could be supplied by sea. They, enormous amounts of gasoline could be brought in by US tankers. They were distant enough from Japan that Japanese fighters could not reach them. And by February, March of 1945, there were bases on Iwo Jima, U.S. fighter bases, that could help the B-29s as they went in Japan about halfway and could serve as emergency airfields. And the result of that was during 1945, from February until June, the U.S. Army Air Force essentially burned down 80% of the industrial production of Japan. At the same time this was happening, there had been an earlier project to develop a nuclear weapon, and that was manifested over Hiroshima with a uranium bomb of about 15 kilotons, and over Nagasaki with a much more efficient plut plutonium bomb of about 19 kilotons, and that meant that the United States now had two different prongs, a very successful conventional fire rating uh, strategy, but a new weapon that was so awesome that it might shock the Japanese into surrender. And remember, the purpose of these bombing campaigns, along with submarine campaigns that attacked Japanese tanker fleets, supplying strategic materials to the homeland, and mining the harbors so that even if they got through a submarine wolf pack, they could not uh, dock because the harbors were mined was to stop the invasion of Japan. We had gone in to Okinawa on April 1st, and by June, uh, mid-June, uh, early July of 1945, we had secured Okinawa, but we had lost 50,000 casualties. And the Japanese had created a new weapon, a kamikaze suicide bomber, and it was essentially a cruise missile the human brain substituting for a sophisticated computer. And they found that if you took a obsolete zero fighter, 
and you put a pilot in it that was going on a one-way mission, and he was navigating the plane in a way much more sophisticated than a V-1 or a V-2 rocket even, and he could double the range because he didn't have to come back. He only had to go one way on his fuel supply, and he was either going a few feet above the ocean and was therefore impervious to radar detection, or he was going very high so when he came out of the clouds, he could reach speeds of nearly 400 miles. It was a devastating cruise weapon. And off Okinawa, they, we lost about 17 major ships and we had over 300 attacks on other ships. And the result was we lost uh, about 12,000 dead Marines and sailors on the island and off the island and 50,000 total casualties. And people in the United States went into panic. If you take the assets on Okinawa and you multiply them by 20 or 30, which we knew existed on the Japanese mainland, over five million potential soldiers, 7,000 kamikaze pilots. How are we gonna take this island? Are we gonna have to give up like World War I and, and sort of say, let's have an armistice and leave their government intact? And so the answer was, we have to find a weapon that precludes losing a million casualties through a land invasion. And that's what was the impetus behind the use of the atomic bombs. I will say at the same time that this was happening, LeMay was, although he knew that there was the 509th Composite B-29 Atomic Squadron, he was very confused about the entire program. He said, wait, 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 wait a minute. I have burned down 85% of the urban core of Japan. You're not gonna have to invade. We can stop the Russians from getting into Japan or taking over all of Korea, and they had come in in mid-August, if you'll just let me continue my incendiary campaign. And by that he meant, we now have Okinawa. It may have been unwise to take it, it may have been too costly, but we have it. It's not 1,600 miles from Japan like Saipan or Tinian or Guam. It's only 350. And World War II is over with in Europe. And what does that mean? That means that we've got about 10,000 bombers, B-17s, B-24s, British Lancasters, medium B-25s and six. We can bring them all over to Okinawa and we have another 2,000 B-29s on order and we still have the 2,500 B-29s with these superior bomb loads in the Marianas. And between the Mariana B-29s and the new Okinawa fields, we can fly not three times a week or four times, we can fly twice a day. And we can have 10 or 15,000 bombers. And he was envisioning an in inferno that's almost comparable to something out of Dante's Inferno. And uh, I, we don't know what would have been the effect of that fire ray, but it would have largely precluded a land invasion of Japan. So if we you sort of aggregate all of these considerations into a final analysis, I think we can say that the dropping of the two bombs at Hiroshima and Nagasaki precluded a fire campaign that would have killed far more Japanese than would have been lost in an American invasion and probably would have precluded the need for an American army to land on the Japanese islands. And so we usually say, well, the B-29 that dropped the two atomic bombs were only necessary to stop a land invasion or they were used by Truman to show Stalin, be careful, we have the ability to deliver a nuclear weapon or they were just terror weapons or they were manifestations of American racism. No, I don't think any of that, uh, they're, they're not logical assumptions. I think the real reason that we dropped these two atomic bombs were, do we really want to starve the Japanese people or to burn most of the, the civilian population uh, alive because we have the capability now with using the assets from two theaters and the Okinawa, Okinawa bases to na napalm Japan back into the Stone Age. As we conclude the, the idea of air power in World War II, we have to ask ourselves, well, what was it all about? Was it worth it? 40% of the U.S. budget was invested in bombers and fighters and transport planes. It's somewhat similar in the case of Britain. And the answer I think is yes, because the way to look at it is, Britain fought the first day of the war, September 1st, all the way to September 2nd, 1945, and, and 
with the surrender of Japan. It was the only country that come in the first day of the war and last to the very last day. In the United States from December 8, 1941 to September 2nd, 1945. But if you look at it that way, the United States lost about 400,000 dead through accidents, disease, and combat. Britain lost a little bit fewer and yet defeated a far more formidable enemy than was true in World War I. In other words, Germany, Japan, and Italy were far more powerful uh, allies and enemies than had been caught the Imperial German Army of World War I. And how did they do that? And how did they lose only about two to three percent of their entire military forces? And the answer was sea power and air power did one thing. They avoided the need to land in Europe at the very beginning of 1940-41 in the case of British and the United States in 42 or 43 in Japan. In other words, we did not do what we did in 1917 in the case of America and the British in 1914. We did not bleed white our ground forces to take the enemy capital and knock the enemy out of the war. We bombed them into submission and therefore precluded an invasion of Japan entirely, and we precluded an invasion of Europe until we were ready to do it in June 1944. So the ultimate verdict, I think, on air power was it was very costly. It did not work too well in 41, 42, and 43, but the Allies gained the lessons and achieved air su su superiority and eventually air supremacy that by 1944, 1945, it saved thousands of lives, and it was one of the greatest successes of World War II. In our next episode, we're going to see that the twin of air power was naval power. And fortunately for the Allies, they began the war with the world's largest, the British Navy, and the world's second largest Navy, the American Navy. And by the end of the war, the American Navy would have more ships and naval tonnage than all the navies in World War II put together and as a twin to air power, we'll explain why the Allies won. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Hillsdale Online Courses podcast. If you want to continue learning about World War II or other topics, please visit hillsdale.edu forward slash course. There you can find over 40 free online courses, including American Citizenship and Its Decline with Victor Davis Hansen, C.S. Lewis on Christianity, Ancient Christianity, the Rise and Fall of the Roman Republic, and many more. The courses include additional readings, study guides, fully produced videos, and you can chat with your fellow students on a dedicated forum. Upon completing a course, you will also get a certificate. All our courses are free because we believe that a virtuous citizen is the best defense for liberty. So pursue the education necessary for freedom and happiness at hillsdale.edu slash course today. That's hillsdale.edu slash course. Thanks for listening.